applying easy to use instruments um, that allow researchers to manipulate sense and see interactions at the single molecule at the single cell uh, level. And so to give you a little background, uh, Lumix was founded about seven years ago, uh, back in 2014. Um, uh, from the labs of Guy Suisse and Erwin Peterman at the Free University in the Netherlands. Um, so our headquarters are in Amsterdam, um, but we also have offices in Beijing. I'm in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, and then we also have a West Coast office out in San Francisco. Um, but anyway, uh, within a couple of years, we were able to launch our flagship instrument, uh, the Sea Trap, which is what I'll be speaking about today. And then a couple years after that, um, we were able to see it adopted by non-biophysics experts um, because traditionally this was a technology you found in highly specialized labs. Um, so we were very excited to reach this milestone, also to see adoptions from pharma companies. Um, and then in 2019, we started to see those non-biophysics labs um, start to publish with our technology. Um, I think this really started to take off in 2020. Uh, we had about 16 publications um, with an average impact factor of maybe 12, and then we've had at least that many already this year. I think we're averaging one publication a week from our, our user base, which is super exciting um, for a young company. So for today's talk, uh, I'm going to break it down into four steps. Uh, I'll begin by talking about why you might be interested in studying dynamic single molecule research. Um, I'll move into what exactly is our instrument, uh, what is the technology behind it, and then I'll talk about its research applications. So what are all the different um, systems you can study? Uh, and fourth and finally, I'll talk about the research support that Lumix offers. Um, so I think we're different than a lot of companies. Uh, we don't place an instrument in your lab or in your core. Um, well, we do do that, but then, you know, you get an application scientist, you get people there who want to help you uh, and want to see you publish. And we check in, we make sure your assays are working, um, and we make sure that you're getting in, um, getting to do exciting research. So to begin talking about why you would be interested in studying dynam dynamic single molecule research, I want to begin with this kind of silly example from Dr. Stephen Chu, uh, who obtained a Nobel Prize in physics back in 1997 for some of the technology we'll be discussing today. Um, and that example is that uh, Dr. Chu famously joked that the average person has one ovary and one testicle if you look at the population as a whole. Um, and that's absurd, right? Um, because we exist, you know, at that single molecule, single person level, you know, we know that that's not true. And, and that was sort of his point. You have to look at the individual uh, molecules to understand the, the function. Um, to take a closer look at that, um, you know, when we look at biological systems, we see that there is molecular heterogeneity, both spatially um, and temporally. Um, and proteins, you know, can undergo various um, post-translational modifications, have different functions um, throughout a cell's life cycle, et cetera. Um, and for the, the most part, we have two tools to study this. Uh, one is to look at its structure. Um, so you can use tools like cryo-EM or X-ray crystallography. Um, to see what a molecule looks like at the atomic level. And then to understand its structure, what we typically have are bulk assays. So this may be um, something in vitro, like in a test tube. Um, if it's a polymerase, you may run a gel and, and look at um, the activity um, or the output from that, um, from that assay. Or it could be something like a fluorescent reporter inside of a cell looking at where it localizes or what its activity is. Um, but all of these assays give you an ensemble average and don't tell you about the underlying um, population. So um, to give you more of a, a clear example of this, I just want to walk through an example of, of DNA binding proteins. Um, so if you're interested in looking at something like a helicase uh, shown here in green, um, and how it functions on DNA in the presence of, say, a cofactor um, or a transcription factor or something, um, what you would do, again, is look at the structure, and then you would have some sort of bulk functional assay. Um, but unfortunately, this wouldn't tell you a lot about the molecular mechanism um, involved. So we believe uh, in order to make breakthrough discoveries and understand these underlying mechanisms, you need to essentially do three things. Um, you need to demonstrate direct proof of how the molecular mechanism works. Um, so does this associate with the molecule of interest? 
um, then bind DNA and then start to unwind it, call this path A? Um, or does it bind to the DNA first, start to open it, um, but then requires, say, this cofactor um, to process? That could be, you know, the other path. And so what you would want to do is to observe the stepwise assembly of these uh, biological complexes to figure out which pathway it takes. And finally, you might want to go back and modulate the system to test the hypothesis um, under different uh, conditions or in the presence or absence of different inhibitors. So kind of to reinforce this, you know, it would be great um, if to demonstrate the mechanism or to discover, to better understand the mechanism, you could directly visualize, say, the location and the dynamics of that individual protein. If you could also precisely control the stepwise assembly um, by introducing the different cofactors required um, for that protein to function. And then finally, having a way to manipulate your system, or in this case, manipulate the structure of the DNA um, and also change the environmental conditions um, to better understand its function. So that brings us to the C-TRAP, our flagship device, um, which enables you to manipulate, to measure, and to visualize single molecule interactions. Um, and although it's one device, it's essentially three technologies in one. Um, and those technologies um, are the imaging module, which can consist of things like confocal, uh, with or without stead, wide field turf, um, or something called label-free interference reflection microscopy. Uh, it comes with a microfluidic stage top, uh, which enables you to assemble your assay in place um, uh, above the objective. And then finally, you have your optical traps, which enable you to manipulate um, and make really uh, fine measurements on the nano scale. So this tool, like I said, has vast applications. Um, anything from DNA protein interactions to studying individual protein dynamics, um, to studying things involved in cellular structure and transport, so like cytoskeletal filaments or motor proteins, um, and finally, uh, things like protein uh, droplets and phase separation. So to go back to the, the technology, I'll briefly walk you through um, those three um, core components, the first being the imaging. Um, so with this, you can have, like I said, different setups. Um, one is the confocal. Uh, so confocal uh, is great because you can have high signal to noise ratio. Uh, we've designed ours to have single photon sensitivity so you can detect individual molecules. Um, and then you can also do things like point scans in 1D, line scans in 1D, or um, 2D images. Um, the downside here is with confocal, um, you're scanning a piezo over the sample so it can take longer. Um, confocal is also um, diffraction limited. Um, so depending on your wavelength, that can be two to 300 nanometers. Uh, if you want to break the diffraction limit, you have to use a super resolution technique. We offer STED, uh, which is one form of super resolution. That's nice because it doesn't require um, special sample uh, preparation. However, it is more expensive because it's a more complex instrumentation. Um, and this can get your resolution down to about 35 nanometers. Now, you can also have a system with either wide field or turf. Um, if you've ever used an epifluorescent system, this is wide field. Uh, it allows you to do image quickly um, deep into a solution. However, because you're imaging through that solution, it's going to have a higher background noise. Um, so if you're working at the surface, you may prefer something like turf, um, which will give you a much higher signal to noise ratio with that same fast imaging capability. Um, and you do see a lot of labs that work with single molecule techniques use things like turf. Okay, the next component is the microfluidics, which we call the U-Flux. Um, so this is a five-channel system. Um, it is driven by a pressure box, um, and there's no physical separation between the five uh, channels once they enter the flow cell. Uh, they don't mix, though, because you have laminar flow separation, which I'll demonstrate on the next slide. Um, and you can control the valves. Uh, auto automatically through the software to decide what reagents you're going to flow in um, to test uh, whatever hypothesis you have. Um, and these flow cells are made out of glass and they can be used um, for months, for years, um, if treated properly. So we often get a lot of questions of what does this laminar flow look like? 
Um, so here um, is an example um, of the flow chip up close where there's five channels. So you have channel one, two, three entering a main channel, and then a fourth and fifth entering um, from the top, their auxiliary. Um, and what you'll see is that flow is going through here and you'll see some channels open and close and you'll see that mixing does not um, occur. And so you see when channels close, um, the remaining channels fill the void. Um, and then when you open the channel back up, it fills um, the space as you might expect. Um, I think if you've seen a microfluidic device, this makes this should make complete sense to you. Okay, now the third component are the optical traps. Um, maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't. Um, I'll spend a little more time talking about what they are and how they operate. Um, because they really are the, the core technology of our C-trap instrument. Um, so to give you a brief historical background, um, optical traps were pioneered by Dr. Arthur Ashkin um, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, when he was a scientist at Bell Labs. Um, I think the first paper here was published in 1970. Um, along with his colleagues um, and mentees, uh, they demonstrated that you could trap particles such as atoms, molecules, organelles, um, and even cells. So things on the range of nanometers to microns. Um, and for this work, he was actually uh, awarded a Nobel Prize before his death um, in 2018. And so for the C-trap, um, you can't necessarily trap atoms, um, but you can trap small particles um, on the order of about uh, 100 nanometers to 10 microns. And once you trap a particle, you can measure uh, very small displacements, so sub-nanometer displacements, as well as both sub-piconewton forces to hundreds of piconewtons of forces. Um, and some of the examples I'll, I'll show today uh, demonstrate this range of the displacement and force measurements. Um, and why this is well-suited for studying biological systems is because if you look at things like DNA polymerase, um, or maybe your kinesin motors, you'll see that they have forces on the order of piconewtons. And then you're dealing with step sizes that are often on, on the order of nanometers. So if you've never heard of optical traps, um, you may be wondering how do you trap an object with light? Um, well, let's take a quick look at um, the example of a polystyrene bead, uh, which is a very common reagent um, or a very common um, object for trapping. Uh, when you're using optical tweezers. Um, so if you have your polystyrene bead, um, the requirement here is that whatever you're trapping uh, needs to have a refractive index greater than the medium around it. Uh, the reason for that is that when a photon comes in, it will refract when it enters and exits, um, such that if you do um, a balance of the direction of the photon out versus coming in, you actually see a change in momentum of the photon um, because the photon carries energy. And what you can do is you can relate this to Newton's law of energy conservation. Um, and you can say that um, this results in a net momentum acting on the bead opposite um, the change in momentum of the photon itself. And what does this look like uh, when you have um, uh, a concentrated light source, such as on an objective? Um, well, that results in a net, so you have um, a range of photons hitting this bead. This results in a net momentum that pulls it close to the focal point um, of that concentrated light source. So if you don't believe me, uh, seeing is believing. So in this video, uh, what you just saw is that an out of focus polystyrene microsphere gets pulled into the equilibrium position of an optical trap. So then, that's how you trap an object. How then do you measure its displacement um, and the forces on that object? Well, um, your light comes through, uh, through your object that it traps, um, and it can then be redirected uh, up through a condenser onto a position-sensitive detector. And that position-sensitive detector is designed um, to detect the location of the light source. And then when something acts on this beat, say a motor protein, um, and pulls it out of the equilibrium position, uh, this results um, in a displacement, which can be detected by your position-sensitive detector 
Um, your concentrated light source has a Gaussian profile, so it's a normal profile, which results in a harmonic potential. What that means is that this displacement essentially acts like a Hookean spring. Um, so the force acting on the bead to pull it a certain displacement delta x uh, can be determined just by multiplying it by a calibration constant kappa, um, which on a C trap um, has been designed to, uh, that you can easily do this calibration. Okay. So let's talk about uh, just some basic examples of, of what you would use optical traps before in case you've never seen this technology. Um, so if we look at the case of a single trap, you can do things like conjugate a motor protein to that bead um, and observe that motor protein as it walks across um, some sort of cytoskeletal filament. Or maybe you're interested in cellular interactions, so you could coat a bead with viral particles. You could bring that bead into contact with the cell and pull on it. Um, and using our fluorescence, maybe see how cellular signaling changes. If we look at a slightly more complex setup where you have two traps, um, you can very easily study things like DNA protein interactions where you tether a piece of DNA between two beads. Um, you can look at things like viral packaging. Um, if you um, conjugate a viral capsid to one bead, um, you can also probe the mechanics of cytoskeletal filaments uh, by creating a cytoskeletal um, fiber or even just an individual molecule between two beads. Um, like I said before, you can study uh, phase separation or the fusion of protein droplets. You can look at things like protein unfolding um, or even RNA structure, which you can then relate um, if you have fluorophores to conformational changes. And finally, our system can have up to four traps, uh, which just enable you to look at more complex systems. So you can create multiple DNA tethers um, and study if they're uh, cross-linking proteins, or you could even create you know, multiple cytoskeletal filaments um, and look at cross-linking in, in that situation or how those two um, fibers can interact. So that is the overview of the C-trap technology. Um, I should add, I, I didn't say this at the beginning, but if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I will address them um, with the extra time we have at the end. Um, because next I would like to jump into talking about these four primary applications. Um, and we're gonna work from left to right, starting with the DNA protein interactions. So the first example I wanna talk about today is with uh, CRISPR-Cas9. So you've probably heard about CRISPR-Cas9. Um, because it acts as molecular um, scissors to go in and let you edit a very specific sequence um, in the genome. At least that is the idea. Um, one drawback or one thing that is limiting therapeutic applications is the fact that you can have off-target effects. And so um, to give you an overview, CRISPR-Cas9 has um, a component that's essentially a guide RNA, and you design a gu guide RNA um, to match a sequence of interest. And in theory, that should take you, that should take the CRISPR-Cas9 molecule only to that uh, genomic sequence. And so the question remains, why in certain cases does it have off-target effects? Why does it localize to regions that don't match um, that guide RNA sequence? And so I'm gonna talk about some data from some sea trappers at Imperial College London. Uh, that's what I like to call them, sea trappers. Um, and this is work they published in Nature, Structure, and Molecular Biology back in 2019. And so they were looking at this problem that I just described. Um, and they wondered, does it have to do uh, more about the steric interactions than people previously thought? So is it not just the sequence, but is it also how um, the DNA is configured? And where this idea came from is from DNA packaging. Um, so people know that DNA is packaged around histones to make chromosomes. Um, the interesting thing is that DNA is rather stiff and that it has a 50 nanometer uh, persistence length, uh, whereas your nucleosome, uh, consisting of those histones, has a diameter of 10 nanometers. So you're taking this stiff fiber and you're wrapping it around um, these nucleosomes, which is going to be inducing stress on the DNA. And so they wanted to test if you pull on DNA, you apply a force across it, how does that affect the localization of a CRISPR-Cas9 molecule? Um, and so here I have a very brief video um, of how you conduct an assay like this um, using our microfluidic setup. <laughs> 
So this video is going to zoom in on the UFLUX, which, like I said, consists of five samples um, or five channels that enter a flow cell. This is what the flow cell looks like. Like I said, it's a monolithic class uh, component. Um, you typically flow your beads into channel one, your DNA into channel two, and then your proteins of interest into subsequent channels. Um, and then once you have these reagents flowing, um, you can move into channel one. Uh, you move your stage there. Uh, your optical traps will pull those beads out of solution, like we saw in the previous video. And then you'll move into the DNA channel, and you'll do what's called fishing for DNA, uh, where you form a single DNA tether, and then you mechanically pull on it to confirm you've caught one uh, single piece of DNA. Once you've done that, you can then move to your subsequent channels to pick up your proteins. And so in this case, it is a protein A and a protein B. And finally, you can move into a, a buffer channel um, to conduct something like confocal um, imaging um, to analyze the location of the bound molecules. And then you can perturb the DNA um, or introduce other reagents to see how they respond. And so I'll stop the video here. I think you get the idea. And we'll talk about what they did. Um, so this is a schematic from their paper. Um, they had their beads uh, flowed into channel one, like you just saw. Uh, they flowed their DNA into channel two. And then they flowed in a fluorescently labeled Cas9 molecule in that auxiliary fourth channel. <clears throat> Uh, and they followed that same workflow. Here's a schematic um, of what that looks like. Although it's not to scale, um, Cas9 would not be this big um, on the length of DNA that they used. Um, but they designed it such that it should only have one uh, specific binding site on their DNA tether. And what you can see in, in this um, image, uh, that's actually a movie I'll play in a second, but you can see there's one location um, on the DNA. So the DNA is stretching from bead one to bead two, although it's not fluorescently labeled, so you can't see it. Um, and we'll watch um, as they pull on this right bead to stretch that DNA, what happens. So what you see is they pull, and all of a sudden, uh, <clears throat> this Cas9 molecule has lots of off-target binding. And then when they reduce the force, um, it goes away. So oh, a very interesting finding. Um, what they did in the paper, uh, I won't get uh, too much of the details, but to characterize this, um, they looked at that 2D image um, and they decided to take a 1D scan um, along the DNA backbone. Um, and they did this for several minutes and they oscillated the force. So they would do a low force of about five picodutons where you would see that individual um, Cas9 molecule binding. And then they applied increasing force ramps of 20 piconewtons, 30 piconewtons, 40, all the way up to 50, every time dropping it back down. And what you can see, or I hope you appreciate from looking at this, is that you get increasing binding with increasing force. And every time they drop the force back down, it returns to just that single um, binding location. And then they were able to look at the genomic positions based on this data and figure out what, what it was about those sequences um, and how similar they were to the guide RNA um, to cause Cas9 to bind off target. Um, and I'll take a moment just to say here that I don't believe they did this in this paper, but you can very easily from these um, 1D chymographs, you can calculate things like the off rate by looking at how quickly molecules unbind um, as well as the on rate, just by looking at the number of molecules that bind um, over that time window. Um, and like I said, that time window could easily be minutes, so you can get a wealth of information about the underlying population dynamics. Um, and finally, uh, we thought this paper was super cool, so we redid some of these experiments in-house. They worked really well, um, and we wanted to demonstrate the power of the STED module. Um, so at times, uh, when you get a very strong confocal signal, uh, if you switch to the STED module, you can see um, that there's actually overlapping signal in the confocal that you can resolve with STED. Um, so this is a very useful um, uh, 
module to have on your system if you're studying crowded molecular systems. Okay, um, and I, I told you a little bit about um, the concept of that, that CRISPR-Cas9 paper and that they thought forces were playing a role and maybe you saw the data and you thought, well, how realistic is that? Um, so I just briefly wanna show you one figure from a paper in PNAS from our sea trappers at Rockefeller University in New York City. Um, they created a DNA tether where you would assemble a 12 mer nucleosome array and then they applied force, increasing force um, to that nucleosome array and observe the unbinding of the nucleosomes from the DNA, um, or rather the unraveling. Um, and what you see is this characteristic um, force ramp followed by a sawtooth pattern. And this sawtooth pattern, um, every sawtooth you see, is indicative of an unbinding event um, from a nucleosome. And what you see is, is the nucleosomes unravel at about 10 to 30 piganewtons. Um, so it gives some credibility to this Cas9 study. Um, and I saw a talk recently out of Northeastern University um, where they had some very interesting data on how you can actually look closer at how nucleosomes uh, or how DNA wraps around nucleosomes. That's really cool. So if you ever uh, see research out of Northeastern, go check it out. Um, and the final uh, DNA application I want to talk about before moving on to the others uh, is on studying DNA replication. Um, so it's one thing to study DNA binding proteins. How then do you open up the DNA and you study things like helicases? Um, well, the answer is actually very simple. You apply force. So on the image on the right, you see a DNA tether um, between two beads um, that is labeled with a double-stranded DNA label, uh, and it's under low force. So it's all double-stranded. When you then apply a high force of about 65 piconewtons, uh, the mechanics of DNA is very well um, described from decades of research. But what you get is you get um, what's called DNA bubbles to form. So regions of that, that uh, backbone open up, um, creating single-stranded regions. And in this image, we're showing that uh, with a, a label for single-stranded DNA. And what I'll show you are two figures um, from work done by our sea trappers um, also at Rockefeller University. Uh, they published this in Cell, um, I guess, two years ago now. And the basic overview is this. They created a DNA tether um, that they pulled on to about 65 piconewtons to generate regions of single-stranded DNA. And they had a fluorescently labeled helicase that would bind to that double-stranded DNA. And by, um, by scanning this DNA backbone uh, over and over again through time, creating one of those chimographs again, they could observe the diffusion of this helicase on the DNA backbone. They then flooded in a single-stranded DNA marker, which you'll see in a second here, it's blue. And they found that this helicase would diffuse until it found um, this region where you have double-stranded DNA matching or meeting single-stranded DNA and it would stabilize. And then what you'll see as I resume the video is that helicase unwinding the DNA in real time um, with the association of a um, tertiary factor. So you can see that tertiary factor comes in. Um, you can see that it's now opening up that single stranded region along that DNA tether um, until um, it stops. And so if we look at the data from their paper, uh, we see that indeed they show this um, and they show you can go both ways. Um, so if you were to remove the force, you essentially close those single stranded DNA um, segments. Um, this helicase then seems to unbind from the, the replication fork that it was at and it begins to undergo a random diffusion. Um, alternatively on the right hand side here, if you have a molecule undergoing random diffusion, like we just saw, when it finds a replication fork, um, it seems to stabilize and can unwind the DNA. So their takeaway was that helicases, when it in encounters um, like an obstruction, say DNA damage, it can actually pop off of the single strand of DNA, randomly diffuse on the double strand of DNA until the repair um, is mediated, hop back onto the single strand of DNA to resume replication.
And what I think is really powerful from this publication was that they took this a step further and they showed if you float in all of the components of the replisome. So in addition to your helicase molecule, if you float in your polymerases, your PCNA, um, they also had a replication protein A that was fluorescently labeled. Um, and then provide that with DIG labeled nucleic acid precursors, um, they could see um, replication occur in real time. Uh, and so what they did is, is they um, had their DNA tether that they pulled on to create a replication fork. They saw their CMG molecule bind. Um, their polymerases and their PCNA was unlabeled, so it was unclear if it bound or not. But then when they moved it to a Psi-5 channel that would bind um, to the newly incorporated nucleic acids, they indeed saw that replication had occurred. So they created this really cool way to have an in vitro replisome. Um, which opens the door to studying so many facets of DNA replication. Um, and so to conclude, uh, they were able to build a model I won't talk about um, because we have other applications to get through, but this was all possible because the CTRAP enables you to do things like control the tension of your DNA, um, to change it from double-stranded to single-stranded DNA. Uh, and it allows you to look at individual molecules, such as this helicase protein, um, and observe its spatial temporal activity. And finally, with the UFLUX uh, microfluidic device, you can sequentially build um, the components um, and test them in a very methodical way. So with that, I will move on to discussing uh, topics related to protein dynamics. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about um, the kinase ADK. Uh, many proteins in your cells, such as kinases, can regulate their activity by changing their structure. Um, for this ADK molecule, it can go from a closed to open conformation, uh, which is associated with a 17 angstrom or 1.7 nanometer um, change in conformation. Um, and like I said, with optical tweezers, you can see these small changes uh, to test this and to, uh, to essentially paint the um, conformational landscape. You can attach this molecule um, to DNA handles through things like malignide conjugation, um, by BBR conjugation, um, and then pull on it to see at what point or at what force does it open up. And here's just a little cartoon of, of how that looks. Um, essentially, you would have your, your tether um, or your molecule tethered between two beads. You would then move one of the beads to apply an increasing force until at a certain force, say around 30 picanewtons, that protein would open up and you would get a drop in the force followed by a subsequent increase. Um, once you have that information, you can actually go back um, and measure the energy landscape by holding that protein at um, a fixed force. So in this case, they, they went back and they held it, you know, roughly at that, say, 30 piganewtons, um, and they observed how the protein um, fluctuates from an open and closed conformation at that fixed force. Um, if you're not interested in energy landscapes and you're like, okay, what's the point of this? Um, well, what's really cool is with the microfluidic device, you could flow in different concentrations of, say, an inhibitor, of a cofactor and see how the conformation changes in real time with changing concentrations. Um, and so I also want to point out that it doesn't just have to be proteins. Um, we have many customers who are interested in probing um, the structure of DNA and RNA. Um, I actually included this slide last minute. It was uh, it's a preprint on BioArchive that was put up maybe a couple of weeks ago, um, and they were interested in studying tRNA. Um, tRNA is um, in, in very important um, for um, transcribing RNA, and similar to this protein, uh, you can anchor your tRNA to two beads via DNA handles. Um, and what they did is they held this um, at different forces, so 14 picanewtons, 12 and a half picanewtons, 11 picanewtons, and 9 picanewtons, and they observed the fluctuations of these um, three hairpins as that protein unfolded, um, or sorry, refolded since they were reducing the, the forces. Um, and this was able to tell them more about the biology involved. Okay. 
Now, the final application related to protein unfolding that I want to bring up um, has to do with heat shock proteins. Uh, and these are sea trappers out of AMOLF um, in Europe. Um, and this was work they published in Nature last year. Um, so they were studying this heat shock protein 100 um, and understanding how it can refold or how it plays a part in refolding unfolded proteins. So here they weren't really interested in the protein they were unfolding. So it's this MVP protein. They used the optical tweezers to pull on this protein and unfold it. They then exposed it um, to your heat shock protein and observed how um, that acted. Um, and they looked at the displacement information and they saw this characteristic pattern, um, which um, if you look at a zoomed in picture shown here, it has a very characteristic displacement of about 360 amino acids with a very characteristic velocity. Um, and I'll show you a really cool video next that describes why that information is important and what they were able to take away from it. Um, so this is a video created by the lab. Um, that basically says, hey, they're interested in studying how um, in certain diseases, uh, protein plaques or protein aggregations um, are uh, segregated. Right, so this is just demonstrating when you have partially unfolded segments, more and more proteins co-localize and create an aggregation. <clears throat> This is their heat shock protein 100. Uh, it's a little hard to tell from the video, but it has a pore in the middle. And it is known that that pore is involved in extruding um, misfolded proteins, but the biophysics um, before this paper were, were poorly understood. And so like I showed you before, um, they took their uh, protein of interest between two beads, they pulled on it to unfold it, as you're seeing in the video. They then took this into a channel um, with the heat shock protein fluorescently labeled. So you'll see the background intensity rapidly increase. You'll then see a heat shock protein bind, and then they'll move out of the channel so that the background signal decreases. There they moved into the channel. Now you can see that single heat shock protein um, binding. What they observe is that sometimes it only um, extrudes one side of the chain. So here it's the, the left side. However, it can bind to the other side and only pull that side as well. Um, or it can bind to the middle and pull both sides. So in effect, it's pulling with a faster velocity. And this is the biophysical information coupled with the fluorescence information um, that they were able to study and they were able to generate their model, um, which is what they'll show next. Um, they essentially hypothesized from their work that if you have a completely misfolded protein, it makes sense for the heat shock protein to grab on to essentially that noodle and just pull it straight through on both ends. However, you wouldn't want to do that um, in the case of a partially misfolded protein. So with a partially misfolded protein, you would probably want to bind on to one end, um, pull just one end, like we saw um, in their in vitro assay, and then release that protein so that your chaperone proteins can come in and help refold that protein. <clears throat> so if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, check out Sander Tanza's paper in Nature from last year. Um, it's a very cool. But with that, I will move on to the third topic, which is studying uh, cellular structure and transport mechanisms. And uh, I'll begin with a very simple example of studying the viscoelastic properties of cytoskeletal filaments. So instead of creating a DNA tether, you can do something like creating a cytoskeletal uh, tether between two beads. Um, and this is work done by seed trappers at uh, Gotingen University um, out of Sarah Coaster's lab. Uh, and you can see that you, know, you can fluorescently um, look at this protein. They were studying vimentin, which is an intermediate filament, and they were pulling this vimentin at different um, velocity rates um, to very high forces. So I said you can exert, you know, you can measure and exert very small forces, so picanewton, 
In this example, you can even you can go up to tens or sorry hundreds of piconewtons. So they were pulling these vimentin uh, tethers up to five or six hundred piconewtons at different rates. Um, and the takeaway findings were that if as you increase the loading rate that you apply to this intermediate filament, you actually get an increase in the energy that it dissipates um, from the the hysteresis in the curve. Um, and this is actually a really cool finding. They've had several papers that they've published on this, looking at different salt concentrations um, and other variables. But what's really cool about this is uh, intermediate filaments are thought um, to protect cells from unexpected stresses. So this data supports that idea that if you pull on a cell really hard, um, you have intermediate filaments that will respond, protect the cell, and absorb that energy. However, uh, you don't have to limit yourself to just uh, filaments. You can even look at cross-linkers. Um, so this is a preprint that's still in BioArchive, um, hasn't made it to a full journal yet, um, but they studied actin bundles uh, that were cross-linked with this protein anilin. Uh, they were motivated by this because anilin is involved in cytokinetic constriction during cell division, um, pulling that, that cell into two daughter cells, um, but it was unclear whether anilin interacted with myosin or what role myosin played. Um, and so they were able to look at um, force displacement curves showing that anilin by itself without myosin had this really interesting effect where it could pull on the actin filaments causing them to contract um, somewhat similar to myosin um, but without any myosin involved. Now, however, um, a lot of the assays you see for cytoskeletal applications actually occur on the surface. So this is different um, than the like dumbbell DNA binding protein assay I showed you earlier. So in this case, what you would do is you would trap a bead in suspension that you flow in the microfluidic device. Um, you would have something like cytoskeletal filaments on your surface. Uh, and so you would move that bead um, down to the surface. Um, perhaps your bead would have something like a motor protein. Um, you could use imaging modules such as TERF um, or this label-free IRM to visualize your cytoskeletal filaments and also see your bead. Um, and then you can make measurements um, such as step sizes or stall forces of your motor proteins of interest. And that is what I briefly want to talk about, um, is how you characterize the biophysical properties of motor proteins. Um, so I think you saw this schematic previously but you can trap a bead uh, that is conjugated to a motor protein. Uh, and like I said, you can bring it down to the surface and walk it, uh, watch it walk across your cytoskeletal filament. Um, so this year, uh, we've had interesting data from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine um, that they published in JCB and Science Advances um, where they were studying kinesins. So kinesins are very important for cargo transport along microtubules. Um, especially in neurons that have those very long axons, um, and this cargo has to go very far and very fast. Um, they were studying this protein KIF1A in particular because it's known to be both a very fast motor, but also very susceptible um, to mutations. So mutations in KIF1A um, are associated with a host of neurological disorders. And what they found um, by looking at the biophysical information is that this protein can exhibit forces up to about two, maybe three piconewtons, um, and that it occurs over and over very quickly. They contrasted this with a different kinesin called KIF5B, and you can see the curve looks very different. Um, so it, it goes up to four, maybe five piconewtons, and it has long sustained action. Um, so essentially KIF1A has these fast low forces, KIF5B has these slow high forces. It's almost like a, say a race car versus an 18 wheeler. But what's interesting is, is when you put analogous mutations into these two proteins, the behavior of KIF1A is essentially abolished. It can no longer process and exert forces on the um, microtubule, whereas KIF5B, while inhibited, can still um, perform its duty, although to a limited extent. And that helps to explain why these mutations um, are, are linked to neurological disorders. Um, the final thing I'll mention here um, in applications related to the cytoskeleton is manipulating cells and measuring intracellular changes 
Um, so you can take your bead um, and you can code it with you know, a ligand of interest or maybe a viral particle of interest um, and perturb your cells. Um, I know we have customers doing this right now. We unfortunately don't have any really cool publications to show you except for these neat videos. Um, so on the left, uh, what you see is a cell labeled with both myosin and actin um, approaching a bead um, where it then quickly detects the bead and its philopodia pulls on that bead. Um, this was done with the Titus lab at the University of Minnesota. Um, and then here on the right was a slightly different procedure um, where the bead was incubated on the side of a cell um, with uh, a ligand of interest and then pulled down that cell, which has a red cytoplasmic uh, label. So you can see as a segment of the membrane is pulled out. So lots of opportunity uh, in cellular structure and transport applications. Um, I'll finish this um, by talking about protein droplets and phase separation. Just a couple of slides, uh, since I know we've, we've covered a lot and maybe it's felt like a fire hose um, of information. So one thing you can do is look at both rheology and surface tension of condensates. Um, Protein droplets and condensates are very popular now because the traditional view of cells is that everything is compartmentalized via um, lipid membranes. We're now realizing that's not true. If you look at something like the nucleus, um, where you have nucleoli, phase separation can actually separate components <coughs> without any membrane involved. <coughs> so people want to better understand, better characterize um, these, um, these phenomena. And so like I said, you can measure things like rheology and surface tension. Um, to measure surface tension, you would have your um, protein condensate that you then move two beads into and you pull um, on that protein droplet uh, to do like a force balance to measure the surface tension. Um, in this paper that was uh, from the, I guess, Joe Worth et al. in PRL um, a couple of years ago, uh, they were looking at how salt concentrations affect the surface tension. Um, so you can see as you pull on that, the you can look at the behavior uh, of the droplet. For rheology, um, I don't know if you're familiar, but, but to measure things like the storage or loss modulus, um, you have to oscillate a bead, uh, which is what this schematic is showing. You would have your two beads, um, you would start to stretch the droplet, and then you would oscillate this um, at a certain frequency. In this example, they did 10 hertz um, to measure that storage and loss modulus under different salt concentrations. Um, and so this is a technique you can apply to a lot of biological systems. Um, our sea trappers uh, at uh, Buffalo, the University of Buffalo, have been doing this a lot. Uh, I think they've published something like seven times in the last two years using our instrument, which is super exciting to see. Um, what they prefer to do is actually study droplet fusion. So in this case, I guess this is the one I'm talking about today where you're not using beads, you're actually trapping particles themselves. Um, so you trap your uh, protein droplets and then you move them together at a fixed um, velocity. And using the force measurements from um, the optical tweezers, you can determine how quickly um, those two molecules merge. If you're studying something like RNA and protein condensates, you could label them with different um, fluorophores to better understand the structure, especially when they, they merge um, and see if they form solid condensates or hollow condensates. Um, and finally, uh, you can look at things or you can utilize FRAP, which is fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching um, to see how the dynamics um, work in these systems. So, that covers um, sort of the four primary applications, although, you know, your imagination is the limit. Um, and I would be happy to talk to any of you after. Um, maybe I'll send out some emails and see if anyone wants to set up a meeting to talk about your research and ideas you might have for using this instrument. Um, but I would like to conclude just by emphasizing um, what uh, separates Lumix from like traditional microscopy companies. Um, and I think it relates to the fact that, you know, we have so many PhDs. Um, and so we provide this dedicated team of single molecule experts, uh, essentially with 24 seven support because we're spread out across uh, the world from Beijing to Amsterdam to the US. Um, and we're there to support you with data analysis and experimental design. 
we we give frequent on-site trainings. Uh, we you know annual servicing for the instrument, and then we also like to conduct workshops in summer schools um, to open up the world of biophysics to high school students, to undergrads, um, to anyone we can. Um, and then two last things. Um, just talking about how we believe in breaking barriers and making this research faster, easier, and more reliable. Um, there's two things we launched last year. Uh, so the first is our reagents, kits, and services. Um, if you've been watching this and you don't have a biochemistry background or you're unsure of how you would go about conducting these assays, we now sell kits that can, that can let you study protein uh, folding and conformational changes, DNA protein interactions, um, as well as some of those motor protein assays you saw. Um, and we are happy um, to discuss that with people to get them um, off the ground and running. And finally, uh, we, we launched what's called our Harbor Script Sharing Platform. Uh, before I play the video, which is just you know, a marketing video, um, everything you've seen is you know, controlled by typical software you'd probably expect on a microscope. Um, but what's really cool and what I had never seen uh, before in my work with microscopes during my PhD um, was that you can write Python scripts that basically automate your workflow. So you can write scripts that catch beads for you, that catch your DNA tethers, um, that move your molecule to the surface. Um, and it can, it can speed up your workflow such that you can get much higher um, amounts of data than you could traditionally with single molecule techniques. Um, and we wanted to promote open science. So we created this, this website um, where if you're an experienced programmer, you can upload your scripts. Um, if you publish, you can link to this website um, so that people that see your work can then download your stuff, go on their own C-trap and conduct essentially the same assay. Um, and so it's a really cool thing to have. And I, I think it really speaks to, to what our company is about and what we try to do. So with that, um, we have, I think, a few minutes, and I'll, I'll conclude with a couple of things. Um, I hope you now appreciate where dynamic single molecule can come into your research, how it can bridge this gap between structure and compositional assays and your functional assays. Um, and while I talked a lot today uh, about the C-trap, um, we also have a second instrument that we launched last year called the Z-Movi. Um, I actually don't work on this side of the company, so I can't tell you that much about it, but it enables you to measure forces between things like CAR T cells and cancer cells um, on the order of hundreds of cells. So it's really cool. In like five minutes, you can measure the forces between 500 cancer cells um, and test different CAR T combinations. Um, so if, if that's something that interests you, feel free to reach out. I can always put you in touch with someone who knows more. But um, with that, uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, hope you've learned something to take away. Um, and I'll, I guess we can see if there's any questions and I look forward to connecting with you guys um, down the road as well. So thanks, Evan. Um, this is Andrea Doty. I'm the flow core director for those of you who don't know me. I'm sorry I jumped on here late, Evan. I was running a little behind this morning. Um, but we would like to, in the summer, we would like to try to find a time that we can actually bring um, Evan and or someone else and one of these platforms in. We're interested in doing a demo for this. And if you guys are interested in bringing you know, some samples and checking this out in real time, I think this has some you know nice applications that could help our university move forward. So I will be working with Evan in the background to try to get some of those things on board for maybe, you know, as we come back online in the fall, because we all know everybody's gone for June and July. Um, and hopefully our COVID restrictions will be a little bit le lesser by then. Um, so that's something to think about. But uh, with that, thank you, Evan, for doing this today. I really appreciate it. Um, and we like to support, you know, new companies doing really new technologies. And this was very cool. So I really enjoyed this a lot. Um, and with that, I will open it up for you guys to have any questions to Evan. So thanks for your time, Evan. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I see I see one question. Um, and Andrew, I wanted to ask you quickly, um, will you be at, uh, are you familiar with Woods Hole, their summer courses? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know if you'll be going this year, uh, but no, we're excited that they're finally, <laughs> okay. Yeah, no. Yeah, we're, we're excited they're finally opening it back up. Um, and so we'll be there for a month this summer. But yeah, I would love to, to discuss with you how we could 
bring this potentially for a demo or something um, to get yeah, people hands on with the instrument. Absolutely. Um, and so going on to the question, yeah, can you tune the trap stiffness and can you program step or sinusoidal displacements? Oh, yeah, great question. Um, yes, um, so you can tune the intensity of the laser. Um, you can tune the bead sizes you use and all of that um, can allow you to adjust um, trap stiffnesses. So if you're working with DNA, you might want a higher trap stiffness. If you're working with something like a motor protein, you probably want a lower trap stiffness, um, which is, like I said, straightforward. And then, yes, you can program steps, um, sinusoidal displacements. Um, we have several built into the software itself. And then with the scripting, um, it's literally, I think, four lines of code could give you uh, numerous um, behaviors of the, the traps. You can control them in any way you want. So yeah, great question. Thanks. Okay, well, I will leave it there. Um, and like I said, I, I might reach out to some of you. Uh, it would be great to talk and, and see what interests people have um, because bringing things like this is like a joint effort and it does require interest. Um, so I look forward, yeah, to, to talking to people and, and working with the University of Florida moving forward. And when it is safe to do so, uh, come visit. All right, Andrew and Chris, thanks again. I'm going to head out. Oh, anytime. Thanks, Evan. We really appreciated your help. Yeah. Oh, Chris, you were muted. Chris, you're muted. Although you seem very excited. <laughs> yeah, I know. I said sorry about that. I was trying to kind of push everybody out of the room, but um, <laughs> no, great slides. I really enjoyed it. Cool. Yeah, I will be in touch with you guys. Um, yeah. yeah and, and look forward to working together. Okay. Yeah. And um,